The grace and peace of Christ be with you, friends. Today's message is given for Jesmond United Reformed Church in Newcastle upon Tyne. Our scripture today is from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 17, verses 5 through 10, in which Jesus responds to worried, harried apostles who plead with him to increase our faith. Their plea may well resonate with us who seek to be God's disciples, hand, feet, and body today. I hope you'll take a moment to read it. Please pray with me. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be beautiful in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A few weeks ago, we held a blessing of the animal service here at Jesmond Church. It went not at all how I thought it would go. At the appointed start time, no animals had shown up. We had delivered invitations to the entire neighborhood, but alas, not a soul, four-legged or otherwise, had appeared. There was the promise of one who did later come. There was a small gaggle of faithful volunteers, though. We set up tables and put out chairs. We had brought a large variety of good quality cat and dog snacks, which were laid out. And as we went outside to the front of the church to begin the service, I said, It looks as if we're not getting going to get any animals. I was quickly interrupted by someone who shouted, Have some faith. Now at that moment, and you couldn't make it up, a pigeon came and landed right in the very spot where we were going to start services. It didn't stay, but we said, Bless you, and the pigeon flew away. We gathered in a circle to begin our service, and you know what? Every single dog that walked by, every single one, pulled to their owner's surprise, and ours, into our circle. One came darting in, untethered, jumped right up. Others insisted on joining our circle, putting all four feet down until the owner acquiesced. You know how dogs pull. All who entered agreed to a blessing. We blessed several dogs and never got through any part of the service uninterrupted. The dogs of, bless, of Jesmond were blessed that day to the surprise of many, including me. I imagined it would be a sit-down service that would be over in 20 minutes, but there was a walk-by service of about an hour of joy and blessing. Even when my faith had waned, lo, it happened. Now, this may not seem like heavy discipleship or a serious application of faith. We are, as we know, beyond a cost-of-living crisis into an outright economic emergency. With pension funds having almost collapsed earlier in the week and millions with mortgages, wondering how they'll pay their bills when interest rates have skyrocketed in just a few days. Even we as a church have not yet figured out how we're going to handle the cost of heat here, a challenge we share with everyone as gas prices spiral once more following the seeming intentional destruction of the main gas pipeline between Russia and Germany. We haven't even started on strikes, inflation, global warming, and the global crises around Ukraine and Russia making nuclear weapons threats. Let's be clear. We are facing some difficult times in the world around us. So one might be forgiven for wondering what a blessing of pigeons and dogs might mean in such a time. If the apostles were asking Jesus to increase our faith, then the first question we might ask is, what is faith? And my, why might we want to increase it? Well, I think faith is, among many other definitions, the belief that God loves us. The writer of the letter to, of, to the Hebrews put it this way. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. We cannot see that God loves us any more than we can witness the act of the resurrection of Jesus itself. And much of what we call blessings or acts of love by God toward us could be explained away as coincidence or other phenomena. But our faith is our belief that God affirms, values, and loves us in spite of all of that. This might sound overly simple, but it's not. Do we always love, value, and affirm ourselves? Let's be honest. No. 
We don't. We doubt ourselves. We hate parts of ourselves. We fail to affirm that we or others are children of God. We look at things we do as a community and ask in, and as individuals and ask in our darkest moments, can anyone love this? Faith tells us, God does. God loves you. God loves this church. And of course, our doubts may even, if not inevitably, question whether there is a God. For if we doubt so much that we can love ourselves, we might dare ask, how on earth could anything divine love us? The world that we live in tells us that everything must be explainable, that even ourselves are explainable. But God, as the source of God's love for us, cannot be visible. It cannot be explainable. It can only be affirmed by faith alone, our belief that God loves us. Our inability to love even ourselves at times may be able to be explained by trauma, psychiatry, and psychology, all of which are good and helpful in addressing challenges to healthy living. But to know, even when we cannot love ourselves, that we are so loved by God, that is faith. And that contradiction is something we live with, and even live with with joy. It is faith, too, that binds us together and reminds us of our common humanity. Rowan Williams discussed human solidarity in his book, Faith in the Public Square. Bertrand Russell attempted to argue, somewhat naively, that our biology is enough to form us together in a human tribe. But a person locked in a concentration camp knows she cannot appeal to her oppressor's common biological kinship. She, quote, knows that she was discarded by them as historically harmful, and it is that harmfulness that defines her in the first place, not her membership in the tribe of Homo sapiens. Williams concludes, Something more than biology is required, some imagined community of universal recognition. And that is what faith proposes in various forms, but always steering us toward the realization that we are recognizable to each other because we are first recognized, affirmed, valued, loved by God. Faith reminds us, too, that God wants to be in relationship with us, always, now, but also in the life everlasting. Now, I do not presume to know what everlasting life looks like, but I believe it means that God is in relationship with us, always, without distractions. And that is different from life now, where we don't always feel that connection, and often, as with many of the Psalms, wonder if God is even listening, and ask God to incline an ear and listen to us. We spend our lives, though, grasping for that divine relationship through relationships and love we do experience with others and creation. We cannot experience it fully in the here and now, it's just too much. But we feel something of it in relationship to others, and the loving mutual recognition we get from them that we are each affirmed, valued, and loved. And when someone dies, our relationship with them ends, and therefore our relationship with that particular grasping of divinity is gone. And that hurts. But our faith, the belief that God loves us, tells us that God is now in relationship with that person fully, and with God someday so too shall we. And if that is our faithful goal, what need have we on earth to try to attain some form of immortality, as seems to plague especially powerful people here who want to be recognized and remembered across history? We know without arrogance that we are loved by God, and our future is relationship with God. We need have no fear of being forgotten. So do we want more faith? We can see, perhaps, why the apostles wanted to increase their faith. Their task was hard. They were tasked with asking a jaded and broken people to believe that God loved them. They were asking people to have faith, people whose sons and daughters faced increased depression under a Roman Empire that worked through physical and economic violence to enforce its dominant power. Many people felt paralyzed by powerlessness and loss of identity, agency, and recognition. The Roman Empire didn't see them as people, but numbers and figures, subjects. They weren't sure they could, do, they could do this and share their faith. 
They no doubt harbored doubts of their own that they were loved. The world certainly wasn't affirming them. But they also wanted to share this. They pleaded, increase our faith in the face of what seemed to them almost certain failure because they wanted people to have this faith, have hope, and know that they and their communities were loved by God. Like those apostles, Jesus well knew that faith is hard to hold on to. Try as we might, we do doubt that God loves us. We go through times where we doubt there's a God. In the midst of catastrophe or existential crisis, when we are surrounded by so many doing so many awful things to one another, when the pain of loss of someone we loved, especially when that person was too young, in the face of war and hate and injustice and oppression and just trying to feed our families and make rent, how to hold on to the assurance that God loves us, not to mention how could God let such things happen. As with the apostles, we may not believe that we have enough faith to be able to share the gospel with anyone else, and so we say, increase our faith. Or we may turn our church not into a place of faith, but a poor imitation of do-gooderism, where we try to do good things for others rather than dwell in the heavy, unanswerable, deep mystery of the God who is God. Those activities, unlike faith, are concrete in the world as it is. Yet those good works we do should be born of our faith. But we cannot do good works as a way to gain faith, sidestepping the awkward questions around God. As Paul said, faith without works is dead, but works without faith may also be dead, leading to burnout, exhaustion, and frustration. God knows the realities of our world, and God's response to that reality was, is, Jesus Christ. A human being living in the world just as any of us, born a peasant, journeying from village to village and being with people, showing them the way to love one another, to love our neighbor as ourselves, as Jesus said elsewhere, is how we act, our faith in God. And our faith in God, love, anything, comes from that. And it's powerful, incredibly powerful. Maybe not on a cosmic scale, maybe not on the drawling large crowd scale, but to one individual who experiences God's love through your faithful encounter with them, it is life-changing. Faith as small as a mustard seed is God's reminder that one act of love, one one one-to-one encounter with another person, one committed relationship changes the course of a human life. And if it is consistent and a person knows they are love, well, love can make a person do seemingly crazy, beautiful things. Jesus told the apostles of a mulberry bush planting itself in the sea. Mulberry bushes were and still are incredibly difficult plants, all thorns and complex roots. But we all know incredibly difficult people, though, who are a lot like mulberry bushes, all thorns and roots. But when they experience love, born of that consistent faith we exercise with one another, they may well act on that and do impossible, beautiful things. But we can only increase our faith through practicing it. Jesus concludes the story by talking of a servant and his master. The servant who merely does his job receives no praise. He merely does his job. It's fine and good, and there's nothing remarkable in it. But friends, Jesus is telling us in this story that we, the church, are the servants to God. And if we're just going through the duties we think we have, that's okay. It's enough, perhaps, to provide worship and pastoral care and keep the fabric of the place intact. But we cannot expect praise from God nor the community for doing just our jobs. Jesus seems to be implying that faith, the belief that God loves us, compels us to do more to transcend that servant-master relationship and go beyond the mere performance of duties. This parable tells us this going beyond is twofold. First, outside in the mission field where we share our faith with others via a radical curiosity about who other people are, recognizing, affirming, valuing, and loving them as we are assured God loves us. And second, in the home or church or we share our holy meals and nurture our faith and discipleship through worship, prayer, and contemplation. Once we know that our work is an act of faith, we can no longer just do our jobs and get by. 
That would make us feel worthless, Jesus says. But acting on faith brings us in closer relationship with God through our work in the mission field and internally in ourselves and our church. This brings us joy. We might not hear this a lot, but the people who study these things say consistently that the people of our world are hungry for a spirituality that connects them with mystery. It's likely we don't know how much we need faith. The dogs who pulled into our blessing of the animal service seem to know they needed something, though we cannot discount the fact that the table full of doggy treats was arrayed behind us. And yes, we may all be slightly agnostic in our belief that God loves us in the world, and even that there is a God. That's a lingering doubt that haunts our postmodern secular society in which we very much live. But Jesus told us, the smallest shred of faith can keep us going. Keep us sharing that faith and love and recognition. Keep us ignited in that radical curiosity with and for one another, affirming, valuing, and loving one another. It doesn't take thousands. It takes, if not demands, one person at a time, one child of God, one story at a time, one relationship at a time for people to know that God loves them and experience something of faith, a mustard seed level of faith that can move the thorniest and rootiest of mulberry bushes. And that work falls to the modern day apostles, us. Can we act on our faith? I believe that is the journey we are on together. Thanks be to God. Amen.